the prison system is modeled off of the American pharmaceutical company. It's not about getting better. It's not about wellness. It's about long-term financially costly management. Welcome. I'm Ben Boyce. This is the Dr. Junkie Show. And today's episode is about, well, it's about a lot. So much that I decided to split it in half. My guest, C. Dreams, has been on the show before to talk about drugs in prison. She spent time inside Georgia's correctional system throughout the early 2000s. And today we'll talk more about her personal experience in prison as a trans woman of color. We also discuss theology, spirituality, free will, education in prison, identity, progress, and lots more. But here's the deal. I booked C for an hour, and then, true to form, I spent the first 50 minutes talking about spirituality and religion with her. A conversation that I think was actually really fruitful and should be beneficial for many of y'all to hear. But as often happens when I dive headlong into conversations about religion, we ran into all the hot topic things that most people avoid when talking about religion, and it made for a bit of a contentious tone. I don't feel like it was a contentious conversation, and I don't think C did either. But it comes across that way at times because these topics are so personal to both of us. Hearing that portion of the conversation before the part where we discuss other topics will likely skew the overall tone of the interview, so I'm going to wait to play that portion of the conversation. C and I are friends, and friends should press each other on their beliefs. They should test one another's proofs, and they should hold one another accountable for the thinking errors that all humans make, no matter who you are. If you don't have friends that do this, you don't have very good friends. So thanks to her for engaging, And I hope all of you enjoy that portion of the conversation, which I'll air next episode. Apologies in advance for a few audio issues. We picked up some squelch somewhere along the way. And C's voice actually goes through a tunnel for around seven minutes near the end of this episode. But it's all audible, and it's definitely worth the listen. C's work is linked in the episode description, or you can find her online or in the Twitterverse. She's someone who's impressed me in her extraordinary efforts to rise above the labels that are supposed to define and limit people like her and I. So look for part two of this conversation shortly, check out Sea Dreams' work online, and enjoy part one of our conversation now. Yeah, I was, I was trying to figure out where to even start today, and we had ended our conversation last time, uh, number one, without quite getting into the education piece that we promised to, so that's on the list today. But you just, before we were recording, mentioned this, uh, one of Trump, I actually mentioned, one of Trump's things was to find an issue that people kind of felt icky about, label it, and then sort of misapply the label to lots of other things that people on the other side would say, that has nothing to do with that. But our last episode, we also talked about how the left is of late fallen prey to some of the same thinking errors where it really feels good to feel woke and to know how systemic racism and misogyny works. And if you don't watch close, your critical reasoning runs away and you apply these terms to things that they have nothing to do with. And you end up discrediting a movement that's got a lot of uh, legitimacy behind it. So I don't know if that's where we want to start. My two thoughts were we actually ended talking about what it looks like now you're writing a paper about because it's on filter the link will be in the description which is the money trap of parole and recidivism and then we also briefly at the very end talked about kind of what we just hit on to start twitter in the current media scape that we all live in this ugh, cesspool of and i, I think the money, the money trap of parole and recidivism is actually my piece with the appeal but uh yeah it's, it's ridiculous it's ridiculous Now I feel bad for not having done my homework. Uh, In the filter piece, I think you mentioned it as an aside that when you get out of on parole, we we seldom look at. This was about college education in prison, but you were including how look, y'all, it's bigger than just one piece of the system. The whole thing is built to run on like a money machine, and you can't just start switching out cogs without looking at how that affects the whole system. Yeah, no. So it's it's an entire system that has been streamlined and perfected to 
create a vicious circle of return. And even if you manage to stay out of physical carceral custody, you end up finding yourself in, in a form of financial peonage still. So still financially incarcerated. And a lot of people find themselves contending between handling their bills and other like day-to-day mundane kind of financial obligations and then meeting the costs, um, especially depending on how what conservative, how conservative the jurisdiction they're from is. Um, so they might end up having to pay for an ankle monitor and for all these classes, supervision, your analysis, polygraph tests, and these easily can run the amount to 600 to a thousand dollars a month, which for the average person, especially somebody who's trying to rebuild their life is just financially prohibitable. It's, it's, it doesn't work. Yeah. But when somebody's in prison and they wave this carrot in front of them and say, well, if we could let you out and you just have to come up with $600 a month to stay out, would you do it? What's the fucking answer every single time? Yes, I'll do anything to get out of here. Yeah. But I think that also comes down to, it's kind of like companies that advertise goods and they tell you, you can get it, you know, with these payment plans or whatever. It's the same thing. It's putting people in a position where they're picking something that they want desperately for themselves. And in the case of freedom, you could say that we have an inalienable right to it. So they want it desperately. They want the continuity of returning to their life and being able to pick things up. So it's disingenuous for the system to place. That's the reason why I'm against cash bail. Okay. Because people will put themselves in desperate situations to get what they want, to get what they need. And um, the system is aware of this. The system is a master of profiteering. It's a master of profiteering and propaganda because it uses the latter to continue to perpetuate the, the uh, prior. Yeah. Yeah. Fair warning. This, uh, I have like four pages of questions and notes that are directly from articles you've written. And there is about 10 million ways this conversation could go. And just like the last time, my guess is you and I are just going to come up with all sorts of stuff we hadn't expected. We've got to talk about your doctorate in theology degree you're working on today. I've got to try to not be the, <laughs> the agnostic me that always pokes when people start talking about religion or I also want to say for all your listeners that Ben Voice is not just a great podcaster and a great teacher. He is a good person. He's a good friend because he took the time to read through my crappy capstone papers. I'm lazy and I'm doing a capstone in place of a dissertation and left me a copious amount of notes and feedback. So that, that's so where I was going to start. I was going to say, I probably owe you an apology. So I, I appreciate you trying to appreciate it, but I have this issue where people send me things to edit and I turn into like a super editor. And I think they expect like four or five comments in the whole paper, anywhere the citation is wrong. I've added commas. I've put special words in and say, you should think about wording it this way. I appreciate you doing your best to give me credit, but anybody that sends me something to edit, I end up feeling like a jackass after because I edit it. Well, well, don't because it helped me. It helped me make a better product so yeah well it's going to be a good project when you get done with it in the way it's written it it may as well be a thesis so you can probably publish it online and just as many people would read it yeah i, I do plan on publishing and I, I plan on making a less academic sounding more watered down book version of it eventually hmm. so do you want to start there Sure. Well, with, uh, <laughs> with, with education in prison generally but maybe specifically your degree why you decided to pursue that specific degree Okay, so I, um, when I went to prison, I didn't really have a sense of direction. I wasn't sure where, where I was going to end up going, what I was going to end up doing. But um, for much of my life, I've had a fascination with religions and not just one particular one, but all of them. And um, with semiotics, symbolism, stuff like that. And I had a deep abiding passion for philosophy and, um, you know, dialectics and things like that. So I just, when I decided to go to school and I thankfully got the financial assistance to be able to go to school while incarcerated, for me, I had to choose, like, it was very easy. I could have gone and got like a bachelor's in like business administration or something like that and gone that route, which would have definitely probably secured my future even more, you know, probably better because you can't go wrong with a business degree if you're trying to make a living. Yeah. But, uh, I went with my passion. I figured, you know, I have all these years in prison, so if I'm going to be studying and dragging myself. And I know me, I'm an overachiever. So if I'm going to be doing that, then I want to do it with something that I enjoy, something I like. And um, so I chose to focus in the field of religious studies, theological and historical studies. And I have a master's in theological and historical studies, and I'm working on my PhD in um, theological and historical studies. 
And uh, originally, why I, while I originally studied the development of doctrine, so a historical discipline, studying the development of doctrine and tracing its interplay with society and how a society um, changes and how its ethos and mores evolve and the technology and the industry becomes more advanced, it in turn will change or impact both the face and the creed of the religion. So that was originally my area. And then when I became, started kind of getting known as a criminal justice advocate and a journalist that focuses on policing and drug policy, I was like, you know, there is an intersection here. I'm reading all of these studies and stuff like that. And so that made me shift into the field of what I call theological criminology, um, kind of the intersection of of crime, sociology, and theology, looking specifically at the impact that spiritual beliefs and religious creeds have um, relevant to the lives of people that have prison sentences and felony convictions, but also to prison adjustment, to how people are able to cope in those environments and recidivism rates, the impact that faith-based communities have had on numerous studies have been done in like Chicago and Baltimore and Atlanta, that so that's that's my niche now and uh, now people realize why i had so many comments on the, on the document because yeah you you actually i like the way you worded it in this discussion all right so as promised that portion of the conversation will be aired in a few days on the next episode but i want to make sure we get back to our discussion about prison education identity in prison and navigating the system I found out, I should have known this all along, but we had graduation for my first set of students about three weeks ago. And I found out um, one of them gave a great speech and mentioned before he started school, he had to call his mom and have this really awkward conversation where he said, so I really want to do it, but I'll need some money. And she was like, is that what you're doing? Is like him hawing around asking me for money? In most prisons, if you do sign up for official education, you can only have one assignment, which means your four cents an hour job that was just barely buying you stuff is gone. And I reread now your description of seeking funding and trying so hard, reaching out to people personally. And it struck me differently the second time I read it after realizing my students are giving up hygiene and snacks and the ability to write letters and make phone calls so that they can get an education. And it's kind of infuriating. That's the least of the things you got to navigate, but do you want to talk a little bit about the things you've had to fight through to become this person who now can rap with the guy that sounds like an atheist, but I promise I am agnostic. Show me the evidence, anybody. I'll just change my mind. It wouldn't take well, much. My whole thing is I, it's not even about the belief. I, I consider myself a historian, a theologian, and a little bit of a philosopher. So I like those hats. Um, yeah. I shoot, man, it's so hard. They don't make it easy. They don't, they don't try to enable you for rehabilitation. There is, there is nothing that they are doing for these people who are incarcerated. They are not trying to better situate them. They are not trying to do restorative justice. They are not trying to redeem people, fix people, provide them outlets. They're not trying to address criminogenic factors. They don't care about any of that. They are literally just warehousing these people. So when you get guys like your student who is actively trying to educate himself, you know, and their studies suggest that just a bachelor's degree can lower recidivism by 48%, which is, that's crazy. Just a bachelor's degree. Yeah. We should be handing bachelor's degrees out <laughs> to every prisoner. Like yeah. every prisoner should be getting that. Should be, yeah. that should be part of your case plan. So but, the hoops uh, we jump through though. Yeah. The system is indeed set up in, in not just a warehouse, but to like warehouse and keep people cal like St. John's Ward, right? Like keep people yeah. calm, keep their sexuality tamped down and get this thought in their mind that Megan and I talking a couple weeks ago termed, yeah, I ain't, I ain't shit syndrome. Megan. I love that that episode too. So maybe we can do one in, in six months when my semester is done. We should try to get one together where all three of us get together. I would talk. love, love to meet so you. Damn. I really enjoyed the episode. I had, I listened to the whole thing. She, Megan and I cussed a lot because uh, full disclosure, yeah. Megan brought me a 12 pack of, blue moon which is like i drink water beer like coors light and i think i was two or three in by the time we started recording so there was a lot of f-bombs in that episode <laughs> oh God, yeah. yeah but um like megan said the education is so powerful like i believed in myself but i didn't believe in myself like if you would have told me eight years ago that i was to be a phd candidate i would tell you you're fucking crazy because 
I'm thinking in terms of like financial loans and, you know, like the sheer amount of rigorous work. And if you would have told me how many pre-recorded lectures I was going to listen to, I probably would not have done it. <laughs> but uh, it's like dry, dusty stuff too. And I love my, my academic advisor. You know, I feel like the prison system needs to be creating environments where prisoners are getting skill sets and they're getting education because it's so important. It's impor- so important as far as like making people, these people believe, a lot of these people, no matter what type of uh, bravado they display, a lot of people don't believe in themselves. These, these adults, women who right. are incarcerated, they've heard tales about people in their predicament their whole life. It's enshrined in pop culture and movies and in music. And the way that the officers are trained to deal with incarcerated people is they are trained in a form of psychological warfare to bring you down to the level of a shadow property and St. Ode property at that. And um, in the States, like you're talking about, like Colorado, they pay their prisoners. It's not much at all. It's like, how much did you say it was like? It depends on the job, but I think that they start dishwashing and it's 98 cents a day or something, which is actually pretty good pay compared to a lot of the rest of the country. So Georgia is among the five states that does not compensate any of its prisoners for any labor whatsoever. Mm. And it's so crazy because when you, I can't remember the exact number, but I read a study that was like 20 something percent of our gross national product that leaves the country via exports is produced through prison labor. Companies like AT&T, McDonald's, Victoria's Secrets, GM, they have benefited from prisoner labor. And so you have this source of, and don't get me wrong, these county diversion programs, state courts, whatnot. I don't know exactly how I've been trying to investigate this forever, but you cannot tell me there's not some type of kickback or some type of financial incentive that's occurring for this mass level of incarceration and warehousing bodies without rehabilitating them. The whole rhetoric of the criminal justice system or injustice system, this person has broken the social contract. They have violated the law. They need to go somewhere to receive corrections and be rehabilitated and then restored to the community where they can societally reintegrate and become a meaningful addition to it. Okay. But that's not happening at all. So if we were to create programs, these people would be able to, um, you know, these men and women would be able to not only have a future, have a brighter one at that, they'd feel better about themselves. Underlying criminogenic causes that we know generate crime would disappear. Yeah. But I also think about what was very unique about your student situation is he's being put into the position where he has to choose to sacrifice and struggle now for the possibility of a future that's better down the road. And I understand that that is part of life. Like, don't get me wrong. Almost everybody has had to sacrifice or struggle to some degree in the presence, in the present so that they could have something bigger or better or whatever in the future. However, I feel like when we're talking about a group of people that are so vulnerable and who are locked away and who we know the, the, the statistics and the data heavily skew in favor of their returning to prison within three years, it seems like we should be giving them a golf handicap. You know, I feel like we should be giving them a bonus. And um, yeah. I personally did not find myself in the position where I had to choose between food goods or or hygiene or medicine. But I do know, and I don't know many students that were in prison with me, but I do know one person that did. Her aunt was like, this is another transgender person. Her aunt was like, well, I will send you to school to get your veterinarian assistant degree. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think that's what veterinarian assistants have. I'll take it. uh, But she was like, you know, it's a year long program. And that means that you'll have to go a year without commissary. So I do know that that happens. What are we saying if we're we're saying that there's kind of a built in penalization for wanting to better yourself? I think the term, the the sentence I use is people shouldn't be able to get out of prison without having a degree or certificate for something. You're taking people that are so desperate and misprogrammed and in such a bad place in their life that they're committing crimes that land them in prison. And then you're putting them in a place that's guaranteed to make the trauma, addiction, self-loathing worse. And here's where it goes all the way up. But what about your students with college degrees? A lot of them still are dealing with I ain't shit syndrome because even though they're passing the classes in their mind, they know that it might not fucking matter. They might get out of there with a master's degree and still not be employable. The first job I had between getting out of prison, uh, I worked 
in like under the table construction for a couple of weeks. Aside from that was teaching college classes 12 years later with a PhD. And I was an inch from not getting that job because HR was like, we still don't think we can really hire you. Write us a letter, confess to the worst thing you ever did. And I was purely lucky that it didn't fall on a certain list of crimes that by no free will of my own. I didn't just knuckle down and not do the worst crimes. I only did the good ones. I just lucked the fuck out and only managed to get convicted of crimes that were the universities could overlook it. And now they get to gold star their name and say, hey, we hired a felon. All of them are still dealing with that. And that's what I walk into every day when I go to prison is like, we are not the the saviors that we would hope to be at because the system still, still built it so that a lot of those students are going to be fucked no matter what they do. Absolutely. You just said some real ass shit like that resonated so <laughs> deeply with me over here. Like I'm serious because like I worry that I am going to be the most overqualified, you know, customer service representative for the rest of my life. You know, <laughs> I do because it's very real. And I let me show you how much it bothers me. You can see over here on my library. I even bought a book recently about how I could transition to using my PhD in industry mm. because I worry that like, I'm not going to be able to get a job in academia. And I do think maybe like a Christian based or criminal justice based nonprofit organization probably might hire me, you know, but I'm just, I'm not at that place right now. Right now I'm focused on trying to build my life. So that is a very real fear. And there's imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a real thing. I have a friend of mine who is a felon, who is a lawyer, has been a lawyer now for about three or four years. And she oftentimes does not she doesn't feel like a lawyer, no matter what that paperwork says. And mm-hmm. I know what that, that I know what that feels like because when um, I, I'll never forget when I got started to my PhD program, I told somebody, I was like, you know, I'm a PhD candidate, blah, blah. And this was while I was still in, you know, corrections and um, security guards don't, they don't, they don't get the security personnel. They don't give a fuck. Like if anything, it makes them antagonistic towards you. So I was, I showed her my little letter. I was excited. She was my detail officer too. So I figured the type of rapport that we had, um, seeing each other every day, whatever she might at least say, like, Oh, that's good for you. Good for you. And I don't, I think I said PhD. I meant to say my master's, but I, I showed her the letter and she just was like, all right, that's cool. And I mean, I guess I shouldn't have expected more than that, but like, I just felt like, damn, I'm breaking the mold. Like I'm over here trying to do something spectacular and i'm gonna tell you something all of that never mattered to the pro board it never mattered at all so hmm. it's another thing too you got these guys sacrificing financially they're suffering with imposter syndrome they're not even sure that they're putting all their time into energy into this thing that might not even offer you know fruitful paths in the future and then it doesn't even in most cases mean shit to the people that could let them out of prison sooner right so it's it's a very frustrating conundrum to find yourself dealing with Yeah. And at the base of that, here's what sucks is I've started to make sense of it, right? Like once you start to realize, oh, it's exactly why it works that way. We could have started this conversation by saying, let's talk about how if we were to start from scratch and say, what's our problem? People commit crimes. What should we do with those people and what resources are already there? Big concrete buildings with hard bars and walls that we now have internet access in and we want to fix them. We would have a totally different system than the one that exists now. But what you're talking about, it's a threat to the system when people start to get educated and figure stuff out because without realizing it, prisoners call people ma'am and sir, and we are thus in them. And we usually don't realize it till somebody points it out. They're institutionalizing us, making us part of the currency of that agency. But I always say this, and you just hit on it. The prison system is modeled off of the American pharmaceutical company. It's not about getting better. It's not about wellness. It's about long-term financially costly management. The same way the pharmaceutical and medical industry does everything, instead of trying to create wellness and trying to prevent illness, they perpetuate it. The same thing is happening in the prison system. If you gave me control of a state prison agency, I would go around to every prison and I would get all the prisoners in one place. I'd have a freaking bullhorn. And I would say, men, women, I'm going to give you a chance to be everything people out there are trying to say you cannot be. If you want to be a veterinarian, you're going to be a veterinarian by the time you go. If you want to be a tech uh, engineer, you're going to be an engineer. If you want to be a mechanic, you're going to be a mechanic. You want to be a hairstylist. And I would work with colleges to get the colleges in there. I would take some of the, the budget that we use for pay raise and for plump, useless administrators. Okay. 
all these damn desk jobs. And I would go ahead and I would channel that into the agency. And what I would tell the guys that and the women that are not serious is if you don't want to be at one of my college prisons, I've got somewhere else for you. Exactly. Yeah. That creates an incentive. If that's if you want the gang, I wanna I wanna spend my whole 10 years getting, you know, killing people and, and, and raping or robbing or whatever, we'll have a place for you. Yeah. But the majority of my prisons would be colleges. Yeah. And that even those places, we'd, we'd come up with some clever ways to try to even get those knuckleheads, as our DOC exactly. lieutenant called them for a while, but to get them to, to at least have the opportunity and work your way up. Because we just, yeah, we throw people away. Even exactly. now that we're moving away from solitary, barely, in parts of the United States, we still have this image that's like, we can always make it worse, motherfucker. And that's what's usually in our yeah. minds is encouraging. But I try to disillusion people too. Like in, in these conversations that I have about prison conditions, about prison reform, I notice that there are activists and advocates who are being fucking disingenuous. And uh, some of them are advocates that I respect. They try to make it seem like all prisoners are just victims and that, you know, they're suffering. And don't get me wrong. Terrible shit is happening to incarcerated fucking people. This yeah. is true. But you also have a percentage of people in there that right now, don't want to change and if we don't find a way to induce them to want to change and you can't make somebody do something they don't want to do there are people that i know from my time in prison that i pray they do not get released into my community okay yeah. i'm sorry that's the truth and i know that some activists especially abolitionists which have a which i love abolitionism in theory conceptually i love it and i'm not saying that we don't need a better system than we have right now i'm just saying that's People are pretty out. privileged. Like, talk about having a good life. If you can really be beyond the age of 10 and not, or 20, 30 even, and not have run into people either from a distance, you drove by them, you saw it on the, and not been like, okay, whatever's going on there, this individual has incentives and programming that is a danger to themselves and those around them. They need to be contained for their own good and for the good of society. Abolitionists that say, like, let's just close them all. I'm like, yeah, you don't, it is I'm not sorry. one way or the other it's somewhere in the middle we need to not treat everybody the same but 60 to 80 percent of people in prison are ready right now to move into a program and the second everybody else starts to see there's places they can go where they have ice fucking cream and right like all the stuff that would go along with that because you're clever now you'll get money when they see that there's trajectory for a better set of circumstances and that those better set of circumstances lead to a better future whether they have long-term sentence or short-term sentences for them, yeah. that will be very powerful. They'll be very motivating. But I do feel like, as I said, I feel like, and as you just said, we're not being genuine. We're not in, in order to be faithful to the concept abolitionists are being unfaithful to the data and the reality. And I always tell people fidelity to your ideals does not mean getting divorced from facts. Okay. Yeah. And, and that, that kind of falls into that faith and reason argument again, right. too. I would love a world where we were able to do most of the healing community center wise and that there's no need for prisons, et cetera. I love that concept. Yeah. And I'm not saying, and I know some people that are anti abolitionists, they like to say, well, you need to show me a system because the system we have right now is failing too. So I'm not saying show me an alternative system. I'm saying boldly, as much as that's a beautiful, ideal it's an extreme that i do not believe and i have i remain unconvinced and i don't i challenge somebody to convince me that we could actualize it in a meaningful way that doesn't just spike things through the roof way worse i that think that's a lot of weight with people yeah. i think that we're will we're both and this is because we both spent time in prison and both been in lives even before and outside of prison that were in contact with people that we realize like we're a threat to society and that something has to be done to protect everybody. But I think yeah. most of the time people hear yahoos like us and they, they're like, you eggheads just want to pretend nobody did anything wrong. And no, it is both. No, and people that can hear what you're saying and what I'm agreeing yeah. with that we will still have places where knuckleheads need to go get their minds right and figure out what they want out of life. I think in every important conversation, whether it be politics, whether it be medicine, whether it be prison reform, whether the code words should always be efficacy and accountability. How effective is this policy or this approach or this method? And can, can we maximize its effectiveness? And any shortcomings, failures, or blatant 
wrongdoings, somebody needs to be held accountable for it. I think when it comes to even with offenses in the criminal justice system, people have to be put into a, a, an environment or a, cer- a set of conditions, whether that be therapy, whatever, something that is a cataclyst and a vehicle for them to actuate more positive change in their life. But just saying that people need to be accountable for their actions is not enough. We have to also provide them the vehicle that removes the causes that put them in the situation where that they did what they want to do. But the reality is also, while criminogenic factors are important, like legitimate criminogenic factors are include, but are not limited to, can't get a good job, mental health issues, substance abuse issues, um, poverty. These are legitimate criminogenic factor issues. But I feel like a lot of people are not addressing the fact that more and more crime is being done out of what I call pseudo criminogenic factors, pure greed. I, I don't need, I'm not starving for this Gucci bag. I took this Gucci bag because I cannot afford it and I want it. And all my homeboys or homegirls have it. Identity. And we need to be honest. We need to be more honest and more authentic in our conversations because there are some things that we can address through removing criminogenic factors. There are some things that we can address through slapping people on the wrist and then conditioning them, giving them employment skills, vocational skills, et cetera, so that they don't have to steal. But there are some people that no matter how many times you, whatever circumstances we give them to better their lot, there are some people that are going to do what they want to do. And that's because they believe they can act with impunity. And um, I feel like when we talk about criminal justice or prison reform, we we have to be faithful to the reality of things. And I I know I'm going to end up on a bunch of abolitionist hit list for this. Whatever. I guess I'm on them too. You mentioned earlier, uh, Marshall, Marshall McLuhan termed this, the medium is the message, but you mentioned part of your master's thesis was the same idea that the technology that comes to define any era is in a living evolving process with the humans and what it means to be a human in that era. Technology show up and they inevitably change us, but we're dipshit humans who never notice or understand what's going on in real time and will always spit an answer that's totally inaccurate and just stick with it until 20 years later and then we look back and we go oh it's so obvious now so how do you feel about whether it's just the media scape in general or social media tiktok twitter instagram is this part of the problem that you're talking about where we seem more greedy now we seem more often more willing to to commit crimes because we feel like it makes us identity a cool person yeah my in my opinion absolutely yeah i do i feel like i feel like this obsession with what i call the false self you know, being the coolest, being the hippest, having the most. And the false self also manifests in how we cling to cliques or identities or movements. I've, you know, as a transsexual woman, I've been called out by certain trans activists for being transphobic, which is an oxymoron, um, because I've called the modern trans rights activism movement in some of its more extreme manifestations, I've, I've called it a false self movement, a collective of people that are clinging to what should ideally only be one small part of themselves Mm. and great travesties in the realm of civil rights are occurring. Um, We're ostracizing women. We're making women feel like that we don't stand for them and that we see them as inferior. So whether it's individual actions, whether it's criminal actions, whether it's ethical issues, I feel like social, I feel like technology, the ability to get very proximate to causes and also, um, uh, you know, um, a medium that allows us to be very vocal and also the desire in American culture, Western culture at large, but specifically American culture for the limelight. And and the thing about social media is you can be a nobody. And within a short amount of time, look at my Twitter. I went from a thousand followers, to 17,000 followers in no time. And I'm, I'm literally nobody. Like it was your tag tweet. I mentioned that last time. I, I don't know if you remember, but it's something like, a uh, shout out to all the guys that follow me because they think I'm cute. And then they realize I'm a trans woman and unfollow me. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, that's the one like super viral. Like I had some small viral tweets, but like, that's the, the one super viral, like 30,000 or something like that, that went out. And uh, I got most of my followers from that. So I've had to, I've had to brainwash my following from just being like trans attracted to being like criminal justice purveyors, you know? Yeah. So, you have this uh, way, I sent you a text last night and said, or a couple of days ago, I think it was, and said something about how you have this uncanny ability to run right at the stigma. And I'm one to talk, right? It's the Dr. Junkie show. I start all my classes on the first day by being like, anybody that hasn't Googled me yet, feel free to do so. I'm a criminal. Your dad's going to be mad if I fail you because he paid money, right? All this shit. And 
it, it must come with the I ain't shitism finally in the imposter syndrome, finally, just a little bit starting to wash out where you realize, wait, the identity's still there. So, I mean, shout out to you for some of the ways you've dealt with some some of the transphobic or um, even people that have, you've actually written an article about people that want to look woke by hiring convicted criminals. So they go out and find misdemeanors or people like me that have the nice safe identity, th- identity theft's not safe, but like retail fraud, like, hey, check the box. And instead of just, you know, walking around it, you seem to run right towards it. So there's no question built into that. But oh, there kind of is. Do you know when that showed up between 10 years or 20 years ago, whatever, and now? Because I got to imagine it wasn't always that easy from your positionality. What specifically about like all these identities that you and we share some of them, right? Being a criminal and you know, they're always in the room and that there's always an asshole that's ready to discredit you because, oh, you're just a trans woman. What would you know? Or you're a fucking criminal. I'll be goddamn if I'm going to take Jesus advice from a convicted felon. And instead of just, you know, letting those people have their peace, you seem to have a, a willingness to like the shame doesn't stick to you as well. What have you, what sort of Pam have you sprayed yourself with? So that the shame they chuck at you, you can just brush it off and be like, eh, nice try. I think it's hard to outdo me. And what I mean by that is everything that they've said about me, I've said to myself way worse. And I have a scathing, biting tongue when I want to. The reality is, is that a lot of the things they say, they're not wrong. I'm a sex offender. I'm a felon. I'm a former sex worker. I did crack when I was 18 years old. I am a trans person. I will always be biologically male, no matter how socially or medically or legally I transition. So the things that they're saying, it's hard for me to take umbrage with them because a lot of these things are factually based. Maybe the shading around them is my issue. Yeah. But to say the, the <laughs> least, shading. You see, even there, you're nice. Shading my ass. <laughs> but okay. But- The reality is, is that we live in a world today where you have one or two choices. You can spend your whole life trying to hide from every mirror, trying to avoid the reflection that shows back at you, or you can run right up at them and strike a pose. And that's what I've chosen to do because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I wasn't a criminal or if I wasn't a trans person. It doesn't matter. Somebody is always going to have a problem with who I am. They're going to second guess my whatever I bring to the table you know, and I like, I do like to flabbergast people when they figure out that I'm transsexual and a theologian slash religious historian. The the historian part doesn't throw them so much. The theologian part is what really gets them. And they're like, Christian theologian. That's what I was alluding to earlier is like, yeah, I'd love to be proxy to one of those conversations someday after you've finished your PhD and we figure out sometime in 10 years, we'll get, we'll teach a class together inside a prison, maybe in Georgia and I'll fly out. Before those classes, we'll get together and drink some beers and you'll have to invite somebody that you can have this conversation with because I really want to watch one. That would be really cool. I would like to do that. But, Good for uh, you, though, for being being able to. I mean, again, it's identity and equipping yourself. You're more than well equipped to joust when it comes to sitting down and talking through these things. And that only comes from. You can't from hide from it today world. either. Information is so readily available. You can't hide from it. Like, And I, I did this debate. I, me and my attorney, we talked about it. I was like, look. You know, I want to be an activist. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do all this stuff. But I'm, I'm worried. She's like, I'm going to stop you right there. She said, if you're worried what we're going to say about you, she said, you must might as well go be a paralegal because I, I have a certification as a paralegal. So oh. she was like, don't go into academia. Don't try to do anything. She's like, just go be a paralegal, work a quiet little job in like an insurance law practice, make your money, and go home and watch Netflix. Yep. And she's like, now, if you want to do all this other stuff, she said, people are going to throw you under the bus. They're going to call you a monster. She said, you're a trans person. And with this rhetoric around groomers and child stuff right now, she said, you're going to be a perfect person that they are going to. And there's a, a newspaper public, a, a publication, an online, um, what do they call it? Trans exclusionary radical feminist turf based publication. Yep. Um, JK yeah, Rowling is the head editor. <laughs> they, they, they're called Reddix. And they thought they did like a stinging expose of me. They oh. like, thought they did a stinging ex but like they thought they outed me and i was like honey you must not be paying attention to my twitter feed like i'm open that i'm a sex offender i'm open that my victim was 17 i was 19 though let's check my fucking conviction dates 
Don't just still it. makes me so mad, and I don't know how. Like, I, I'm really good at burying my anger. I grew up as a man that didn't want to fight, but I was taught you're supposed to anger is a tool, I, you know, as a patriarchal culture man. But I always just bury it, but it shows up so quick when I'm having conversations with people. And they're so, this is part of our pro cultural problem. We've checked box, uh, people off the list of things that we all, Democrat, Republican, Christian, atheist, Muslim, we all used to hate them. We could agree if you were using drugs, you're a bat. Oh, that's now up for debate. We could agree, agree that those damn gays shouldn't be able to get married. Oh, shit. We can There's a very small list left. And guess who's on that list? People who are sex offenders, especially if there's any sort of child involved anywhere on the paperwork. Don't get me wrong. Like, if I, if I could rewrite my story, I would be a liar to say that I wouldn't rewrite it. I love the person that I am, but I do not love the storms that I've had to weather. And anybody that says like, oh, I want my storms. I'm like, fuck you. You keep your storms. I don't want my storms. Give me sunshiny weather any day. It wouldn't be you, though. Well, I wouldn't be this variation of me, but yeah. I feel like I'm not sadomasochistic enough to say, yes, give me all of the trial and tribulation that I've had. Mm. I spent most of my 20s, most of my life from the time I was a teenager incarcerated. And I do have certain stigmas that for the rest of my life, I'm going to have to, even if I wanted to live a quiet life, like as a stealth, because, you know, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm pretty passable. So even if I wanted to live a stealth life, I couldn't because I have a public profile and I had a public profile before I ever intentionally built it because when I was a teenager before my case, I was a well-known Atlanta drag entertainer, which is the reason uh. why my case garnered so much conservative media attention. And I think it's so funny that the same things that popped up around my story are now popping up in relation to conversations about um, sex offenders and specifically about trans people. But the reality is, and this is going to piss the abolitionists off. I, while I may not be a prison abolitionist, I am a sex offender abolitionist because we have other systems that work better than the registration. And all of the data suggests that the registration is not effective at doing anything that it's supposed to do. But the reality is, I also think that even if there was an abolition of the registration, that there has to be a serious reform because we're creating things like, um, for example, in Georgia, you can't work or live within a thousand feet of the property line, not the door, not the building, the property line of a church, a school, a pool, a park, a county registered bus stop, all of these things. And so it's really ridiculous. And um, so I feel like if I think something's ridiculous and I feel like nobody else is doing anything about it, and I've already got a public profile, if you Google who I am, you see all these stories from back with my criminal case. So I might as well, I'm going to be forcibly public. Mm -hmm. I might as well build my own momentum and do something about it. Even if I cannot create the change, if I can at least create conversation around the issues and hopefully change, then I've done something. And the reality is, is that people want somebody to vilify. And if they want somebody to vilify, I am all in one body, all of the things that they are against. And mm -hmm. it just so happens that I'm a contentious ass motherfucker. So <laughs> well, and well equipped. I imagine as you've grown too, you've slowly gotten to the point where one at a time, the things that used to result in contention, when you reach in the tool bag, you're like, oh, I just read this thing yesterday. First, I'm going to try this because it'll stink. What's the Bible say? Like when you're kind to your enemies, you heap burning coals on their head. <laughs> when you can just respond matter of factly and people are like. He and that's like when it comes to the conversations on sex offenders, I like to show people how there's literal minors. There's like the youngest person on a registry is like seven years old. And I like to show them this because I like to get them. I like to get them out of their headspace because they think that everybody on the sex offender registry, like if you say I'm a sex offender, they're like, oh, you touch some kids or you rape somebody, whatever. Yeah. And then what we have a really bad habit of doing in this culture is our jurisprudence. The charges are already codified. And so there's just a range of conduct that can fall under this charge. OK, yeah. and there's not like a specific charge for your specific conduct. So, like, for example, I put out to pimping and pandering. But what that doesn't tell you is that doesn't tell you that it was just me and one person who worked the gay bars and picked up Johns and that we fill out over drugs. OK, they don't they don't get all that. And so it's important for me to be able to show them different contexts and to get them to see that just like the word prisoner, sex offender is an issue. It doesn't convey the humanity and it doesn't convey the circumstances. And a lot of times the charges that are being given out are disproportionate. Like this blew my mind. I was recently working on a, an article for the appeal about the sex offender registration and how it's a debt trap and how it's 
a reincarcerator. And I didn't even know that most of the offenses, the sex offenses in this country statistically are committed by minors. That blew my mind. I always, mm. I didn't know that at all. Mm. It's like 35% of the crimes against minors are by minors. And if mm. you look at my case, and if you look at the, uh, what's his name? I cannot think of this boy's name for nothing in my life, but like he was, his case is such a big deal. Like back in 2010 or 2008 in Georgia, like Oprah came down here to support him. And he was like 18 years old and his girlfriend was 16. And they gave okay. this boy like yeah. a 15 year sentence. Rayvon, I think his name was yeah. something. You must but, not have um, married him. <laughs> Sorry, there's yeah. Georgia. There's some Georgia Bible joke. So, is that, there is that like the other side of that history is it used to be like patriarchal. You got to get married and then we'll let just about anything go. So it used to be exactly. people could pull off some, some stuff that now we'd be like, well, there's the person that you might want to charge, but all and of it comes I mean, down to people, failures and rehab. People try to regurgitate like Matt Walsh's uh, rhetoric because he's like the most vehement opposer right now and yeah. labeling everybody a child. But the thing about it is I just like to take a clip of his where he's describing marriage between a man and a woman because he always uses like language like, you know, when she's young and ripe. I like to just take that clip and put it on there. I'm like, and this is the man that's going to talk about somebody who's like, come on. He he's knows his audience. He's a fundamentalist Christian like he wants to take us back to the day, like when 30 year olds were marrying 15 year olds. So like, yeah. I don't have time for that bullshit. Make America great again. Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> do you want to, so I know we've, we've gone way over, but do you want to, we, we sort of hit on this issue of trans rights. Do you want to talk a little bit about what it's like to be a trans woman in prison? And I suppose yours was in a, um, you were a only, men's prison. Yeah. Not yours was, yours was in, Georgia only, right? But I imagine the rules are still really similar everywhere. They're still similar in Colorado. So what's that like? Yeah, there's only a few states that allow uh, trans women to be that are pre-bottom surgery, pre-gender uh, confirmation surgery, that allow them to be incarcerated in women's facilities. And of course, that's a whole big issue of its own that I actually have very conservative views on. So if you want them, I'll give them to you. But uh, it's difficult. I think it's always a challenge to exist in a space that you appear, at least topically, incongruent with, you know. And um, I would say this, I would never, like, you know, I could stand to lose a few pounds, but I would never change the person I am, like, for, like, I like the way that I look. I've always had a very naturally feminine appearing appearance that has made it very easy for me to navigate, especially society at large. But in prison, I have noticed that trans people that, or especially those that have not begun to actually transition yet, but they identify, I've noticed that they tend to have it easier. It was very hard for me in the beginning. Um, I built a name through like litigation and advocacy and organizing like protests and becoming a jailhouse lawyer and becoming a petition writer, helping people be build like beat disciplinary reports and stuff like that. And I was the only trans person they saw also like getting a college degree. And you better believe I was boisterous. So when I got my diploma, everybody knew it. So I think over time, I garnered that respect, but I had to work hard for it. And there is a stigma, much like the history of black women Gay people in well, gay people in the culture, but gay people specifically in prison, their identity has been relegated to and confined to their sexuality. Mm -hmm. You know, in in American history, black female bodies were always broken down to their sexual role, and that's been the history of women bodies in general. But in prison, detail assignments can often be denied to you. Your classification and housing, things like that. People would act like officers would be very suspicious of me if I was going somewhere. They would pay more attention to me. I was more scrutinized. It was always suspected that I was up to something. No, like, you know, I solemnly swear I'm up to no good. But uh, <laughs> it was tough. And um, as some of the articles I wrote about, I had a few encounters of physical violence and um, even sexual assault. And uh, at one point, the Department of Corrections even penalized me and locked me into solitary confinement for like 90 days and subhuman conditions. There was like feces on the wall. There was no running water. There was no ventilation, little critters in there. And um, they denied me communication with the outside world because of the reputation I had. They knew that. The, and sure enough, the first moment I was able to get a hold of my attorney, we filed the last lawsuit that I brought against the Department of Corrections at that time. I know that trans prisoners tend to have an exceptionally difficult time. There are outdated ideas of masculinity and manhood in prison that create 
unpredictable and volatile conditions of competition, arbitrary violence, kind of like who's got the bigger dick type of competitions. But also there is a pecking order in prison. There's a pecking order and certain people will not talk to you or allow them to talk to you because number one, you offend their idea of existence. They don't believe that you should exist. And then there are people who are worried what other people will think about them if they talk to you. Because in prison, there's no idea that you can be this and I can be that. And we can have platonic, you know, not sexually generated conversations or interactions. Right. There's the idea that if you talk to this person, birds of a feather flock together. Yep. So that in itself is also very challenging. And then you would think that trans and LGBT people would click up and create a community. Then while I'm sure that does happen some places regionally or, or, or facility wise, my experience with a tenure, a decade in prison was that there would often be vicious competition, backbiting, friction, and just combativeness among people that should have congealed together and try to create an environment that was safer and more um, comfortable for them. And I think that's really a microcosm of the prison condition at large, because you would think that all prisoners would congeal together and create an environment that is more safe mm -hmm. and more meaningful for them. But um, it doesn't happen. And, I think it's uh, America at large, a microcosm of the country that's been oppressed oh, groups in history. Right. If you can divide motherfuckers against themselves, you can just sit back and smoke their cigars without them even noticing. Absolutely right. You, you said something then. So Have any of those policies, because uh, we've been talking about the other people that are in prison with you, and that all makes perfect sense to anybody that's been in our culture that has, you said outdated masculinity, I wish, but yeah, more outdated now than it was. How about the yeah. prison itself? You had wrote about a couple of years ago policies that were basically uh, set up so that gender affirm yeah. affirming ideas of uh, presentations hairstyles yeah. razors things like that have any of those been fi fixed and do you want to sort of give a i did a terrible job summarizing you want to give a quick summary of what some of those policies are yeah no problem so in the past the department of corrections and this is not just uh georgia this was other states too to the best of my knowledge in the past though the department of corrections did not allow trans people to wear their hair long it did not allow, allow them to um, take hormone replacement therapy at one point if you were transsexual and were brought into custody you were placed on sol long-term solitary confinement you were in a housing unit where you stayed in your cell all day long unless you left from that cell to go to a cage that they call your recreation a cage outside and it was for your protection supposedly but it's the same type of policy they had in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s of segregating people with HIV or with hepatitis. So it's really a pattern mm. of discrimination. And even going back further than that, when they used to racially divide mm. the prisons, you know, there were no mechanisms of gender expression. All of the policies were meant to compel gender conformity and to also forcefully detransition you. And so there was another prisoner, her name was Ashley Diamond. And of course, myself, we had different legal actions. Mine was how prior to hers, but I did not have a big nonprofit legal organization representing me as she did. So I didn't get a bunch of press. If you Google Ashley Diamond, she's rightfully heralded as a civil rights and trans rights activist for prisoner stuff. Um, but my case has been cited by the ACLU. I changed policies around access to hormone replacement therapy. I could facial hair removal on the table as a consideration for trans people. They have to go through a evaluation to determine that it's needed to meet their gender dysphoria. I helped get bras and underwear that were more gender conforming for transsexual people. And the last time I left off, I was trying to change the policy concerning hair lengths. But uh, unfortunately, there will have to be another generation of trans prison litigators who will pick up the fight. Uh, the conditions of the Department of Corrections are marginally improved, but not drastically enough. And I, let me explain why, just to kind of draw a comparison. The United States Department of Justice currently has two investigations called CRIPA investigations. CRIPA stands for Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act. They have two investigations into the Georgia Department of Corrections. One of them was launched in September 2021 to investigate violent prison conditions with some of the most skyrocketing highest numbers of murder and suicide in the country. 
Well, the first investigation was began in late 2015, early 2016, and resulted from Ashley Diamond, um, her lawsuit, and also some complaints that I filed with the DOJ and some other transgender prisoners. And it's investigating the conditions that LGBTQ prisoners live in and the rate of sexual and physical assault, which they are exposed to. Well, that investigation after nearly seven years is still open. No findings have been released to the public. No results have occurred from it. And we know that the conditions that presented dangers to trans prisoners in 2015 are still existent because I look at prisoners like Jenna Mitchell, who died two years ago at Valdosta State Prison. Her family got 1.5 million for her suicide. Um, She died because they were not treating her dysphoria and her dysphoria manifested itself in body dysmorphia, the need to surgically alter her body and uh, it did not end well. And um, so, yeah, we know there's that anger again, like, like that just, it infuriates me because it's so easy and it all, it's so easy as a taxpayer to hear those stories and do the math of it's not just 1.5 million. It's over and over from police misconduct that gets paid out. And instead of just fixing it, to say, let's change the system so that we get people that are in trouble and really focus on giving them whatever the fuck they need and maybe changing the rules so that they can follow the rules and they want to follow the rules. We over and over put people in awful situations where it costs more money in the end. Well, when it comes to number one, prison medical care is in shambles anyway, you know, and they're, they're all, all these state agencies, corrections agencies are privatizing their medical care, such as you may have seen some articles that I've done for Filter about WellPath, the new private company. Yeah. So they have a financial motivation to deny treatments that are needed for any type of medical illness. But here in Georgia specifically, part of the Bible about a very conservative Southern Baptist oriented state, there are issues around the access to transgender care, or I don't even like the word transgender person, I'm transsexual care, gender dysphoric care, transgender care, whatever in the nation, I'm sorry, in the state's cultural discussions, but we see it kind of overflow into the prison arena because of this. They feel like, number one, we don't want to condone the concept, you know, of men becoming women and women becoming men. But more importantly is we don't want the voters and the politicians to think that we approve of this. And then on top of that, there is, of course, a religious veneer. There's a general moral outrage. They find it morally reprehensible and disagreeable that this thing occurs. I remember so, I was a Christian yeah. for a long time. So yeah, there's a, there's layers to it. And yeah. I think it's so funny is because I don't consider myself a trans activist. I guess people like that article we talked about earlier by Reddix, the trans yeah. exclusion. Yeah. The, the article that was intentioned to out me as if I wasn't already out what I thought was so funny about that is they characterized me as a trans activist. And I was like, huh, that's, that's strange. I guess I'm a trans activist in the sense that I'm trans and I'm an activist, but beyond some lawsuits that I won for my situation and beyond the fact that I've written a couple articles, very few, you would think for a trans person who's a journalist, very few articles about trans related stuff. I thought it was weird that they characterized me that. And I realized to these people, that's all I will ever be. They don't see the other facets of who I am, only the facets that allow them to vilify me. And so, you know, they'll point out sex offender, they'll point out felon, they'll point out transsexual because that plays to their narrative. But more importantly, it it plays to the narrative of panic and fear and division that they're trying to create anyway. So, you know, I feel camaraderie to a degree with, you know, the battle for trans rights. But I think that there is a fringe of it that's gone too far. And uh, I don't know how much more I should say on that. <laughs> Maybe we should we should uh, flag that for the next episode. Because, yeah, now we're okay. what do you what do you think about anything we missed today or anything you want to talk about? Any final thoughts? Um, I don't think we miss anything. I think that we can always rehash something or, or move on to something new in a future episode if you'd like to have me back. But uh, I guess my parting thoughts would be this is that. Uh, I would like to believe in my heart that all human beings are trying to do three core or cardinal things. One, create a living experience that is comfortable for them and that allows them to find a measure of peace and happiness. Two, I believe that all human beings, we're very good at pointing out the problem, but we tend not to be very good at finding a solution or even suggesting a solution or even being willing to sit down and in a meaningful productive, constructive way, 
brainstorm solutions. The third thing I would say is I would say that we have as a species the innate tragedy as far as the capacity goes to act like a virus, to consume everything, hmm. destroy without measure, to be unforgiving, inempathetic, uncompassionate, and just monstrous sometimes. I think that what we need to do as people is we need to realize that we have far more in common. We need to give people grace and space to correct from poor path decisions. We need to remember that people are not their worst moments as a human. And we also need to remember that it's okay to have different perspectives. Me seeing something differently from another person does not invalidate the beauty, but most importantly, the relevance, the materiality of their perspective for them and for other people that feel like they feel. We need to stop letting differences of political agenda, of ideology, of religion, of, of anything, okay, be a divisive factor. We need to learn as a culture how to have conversations. And these conversations don't have to be the lines that we draw war parties out over. It's okay for us to see things differently. My biggest issue, and I don't know how to get here. So here goes that whole thing about pointing out problems but not solutions. I don't know how to get here, but I think if we could find a way to normalize in our society, the idea really of live and let live, not not live, you know, let them live. And in the meantime, while they're living, we try to figure out how to fuck them up and get rid of them, you know, because yeah. that's what I see happening. You know, everybody seems to just be biding their time until they can get rid of the opposition. Own the libs, own the yeah. conservatives. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's so ridiculous. And, you know, I'm a trans person. I'm a, I, I, I'm a convict. I'm all these things that are hot topics in our national dialogue right now. But the reality is, is that I don't feel represented by the Democrats or the Re Republicans. I don't feel de represented by the conservatives or the liberals. I am somewhere squarely in the middle and I use my empathy and my gosh damn reason, <laughs> excuse me, my reason to just, to see things through the right way. Yeah. As you talked earlier, people have this terrible propensity to discount the other things that matter in order to have fidelity to their their ideology and we see this in politics all the time like the extremism around biden or around trump as polarity figures people like there are literally people who are screaming for trump's head and i'm not a trump supporter there were literally people that were screaming for trump's head about those classified documents and now they were saying well they're making it up about biden yeah i'm consequences and accountability like joe biden was one of those people by the way how could a reasonable person do this over the audio yeah. while we're talking because yeah like it's like talk about god damn it <laughs> and i was just going to point out i'm not pro-trump or anti-biden i'm just pointing this out all i'm Me saying either. is or pro-biden or anti-trump necessarily <laughs> he's now doing it so it's like he lost some classified documents too so everything that he was saying about trump calling trump's competence and intelligence into question which he rightfully did i would call his competence and in <laughs> intelligence yeah. into question too but now it's kind of like that whole thing one finger three fingers back so yeah the I emperor with no clothes yeah, we need to we need to create grace. We need to create grace and we need to be working on we got bigger issues. We should be focusing on this planet. The fact that we're killing let, let's focus on that. Instead of are all we, are we gonna have to evolve? Like maybe that's what's gonna have to happen is we're gonna have to have an evolution as a species that gets rid of a lot of the traits you're talking about that make yeah. it fun to kill, steal, and fuck everything in our general vicinity, because that seems to be like if you boiled humans down to what we really are all that and then a prefrontal cortex to say don't do it think about it <laughs> that's all we are is we just want everything money drugs sex fame it's a terrible place to end, but it's a good place for us to pick back up when we do this again so absolutely it was it wonderful again. thank you so much for having me again i really really enjoyed myself ben now, these are always really refreshing talks, so I appreciate you taking the time to do it. And yeah, I'll, this semester is going to be the semester from hell. It starts Tuesday because Monday is a holiday. But as soon as it's over, let's try to put something on where we bring Megan back and we all talk. Love that. Yeah. Cool. Shout out I'll, to Megan Cosgrove, right? <laughs> yeah. Megan Cosgrove is my one of my favorite co-teachers in the department. Cool. Thank you so I'll much. I'll talk to you Take soon, care. C. Bye. That was C Dreams. And you can follow lots of links to her work in the episode description. 
There's also a link for a GoFundMe that she's managing right now, so check that out. The heavy part of this conversation, part two, about religion and spirituality, it'll be available soon, next episode. Until then, love yourselves and the addicted people in your life. I'm Ben Boyce. If you're still here, you might want more. So consider checking out my book, Dr. Junkie, One Man's Story of Addiction and Crime That Will Challenge Everything You Know About the War on Drugs. You can get it wherever you buy books. If you want to know what the world would look like if drugs were legal, or why we develop tolerance and sensitization to drugs when we take them for extended periods, or if you just want to know why I went to prison, check out the book.